uh, a day filled with events talking about the plastics, uh, cannabis industry and packaging and sustainable materials, hemp and others. There'll be a lot of discussions, you know, ranging from design, you know, to regulatory issues, uh, to how we are changing the way that we are doing plastic sourcing and plastic design. So on the on the federal level, um, f for decades now, marijuana and uh, for reasons that aren't clear, there's sort of an archaic spelling of the term that's used in the federal law. Uh, the Controlled Substances Act defined marijuana to mean all parts of the cannabis sativa L plant except these uh, mature stalks, fibers, sterilized seeds, fiber, oil, or cake from the from the stalks. And so anything other than those stalks, fibers, or seeds was marijuana. It was placed in Schedule 1 and essentially meant that there was no accepted safety, no, no accepted safety for use, no medical benefit. It was deemed to be addictive. And essentially, Schedule 1 substances are, are effectively prohibited. CBD itself has never been scheduled as a controlled substance, but it was captured in this very broad marijuana definition because CBD generally is obtained from parts of the flower and you know other leaves other than the mature stalks and, and the fibers. So even though uh, CBD products have been around and been available in limited uh, amounts, um, they were really essentially prohibited as controlled substances. Um, there was a, an initial uh, program that Congress passed in 2014 that uh, expanded uh, the availability of hemp uh, a little bit that people sort of took that and ran with it and began uh, uh, developing CBD-based products. Um, that 2014 program uh, was, was only intended to be temporary. And in 2018, the end of 2018, we had uh, what was a, a widely anticipated um, uh, more permanent fix implemented through something called the 2018 Farm Bill. And what that did is it, it established a definition for hemp and then removed the definition of hemp from the definition of marijuana. So that if your substance is hemp, it is no longer marijuana and therefore no longer a controlled substance. One of the things that I've noticed over the years, um, and this comes from the philosophy of innovation, but what I'm seeing is that the, the plastic technology that we're used to, the conventional plastic technology that we're used to, is really um, kind of getting to the, the top of its innovation F curve. So the theory behind innovation S curves is that, you know, as, as a very intelligent species, we'll design and engineer some new solution and it will be really effective for a while and then it's rate of effectiveness, growth of effectiveness kind of tapers out. And at that point, um, it's often very much um, suggested and uh, consultants will always help companies move towards this. But it, it's time to start looking at the next technology platform to jump to so that you do not become um, uh, like last week's news. So anyways, I often think about biopolymers as the new technology S curve to to be aware of. And so as a manufacturer in the plastics industry, it's really good to start looking at the biopolymers that are available today. They're not all perfect. These are a lot of first generation materials. But as we work together, um, these materials will will become um, they will perform well and they're actually going to meet this new design criteria, which is in packaging now, uh, is we have to design with the end in mind. We have to design for the circular economy. And if we can design earth digestible biopolymers that, and when we design earth digestible biopolymers that function just as well as their conventional counterparts, um, you'll, you'll see the jump happen. So let me go through the three areas. I'm gonna focus most on the engineering and materials side of the problem because of this audience but I will do at least one slide on the other two areas too, just to show you how they come together. So in studying the materials and, and the processes, what we've done is we've been focusing on taking the hemp biomass and looking at that in combination with polymers, various types of polymers, and then deploying whole bunches of unit operations that are for all practical purposes, off the shelf processes, rather than developing brand new processes. We're trying to take existing processes. And of course, we have to tweak them to get them to optimize for these materials. But the strategy here is, 
it's going to be very difficult to convince a manufacturer to rip out their equipment and put in new specialty equipment to incorporate hemp in their products. We want to transform the hemp into a material such that it can be used in existing processes. So those are the sort of the, the, the strategy. And I'll use two specific examples just to show you two things we've been working on. So the herd, the woody part of the material, if you consider it and some matrix polymers and look at what kind of composites you can make, we've done a couple of things. We've taken the hemp herd and carbonized it to make a surface active carbon. Uh, we have then milled either raw herd, which would be a cellulose reinforcement, or carbonized herd, which would be like a activated carbon reinforcement uh, into nanoparticles, then combined that material with polymer matrixes, matrix polymers in traditional twin screw compounding processes at the lab scale um, pr to prepare materials that could be used in injection molding or extrusion. And then at the lab scale, we can do those processes and test those parts for mechanical and physical properties. So that's one example of sort of the, the logic behind a material flow in a composites example. What are the mechanics that drive odor through a package? And what are the ideal barriers from a first principle level that you may know of, you know, to help mitigate odor diffusion? So permeability is, is what odor, just like moisture is all about, uh, how gases are going to permeate uh, through uh, the container material. Uh, there again, there's a fundamental difference if you have a, a glass or a metal and it's hermetically sealed, um, odor is not going anywhere. Uh, it will be retained, okay, um, but the odor is not going to go anywhere. If you have a perme permeable material, normally a plastic of some kind, um, then that, that odor, uh, depending on the equilibrium, uh, can either go in or go out or be balanced. Uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide are, are pretty important on this, um, but so is chemical resistance. It's a long discussion. Um, and again, the other interesting discussion is there's a lot of controversy uh, in the cannabis market itself. Um, there's a strong segment of, of users that really prefer a certain order, odor. Uh, there's a lot of future consumers that don't like that odor at all. Um, I'm old enough that I certainly recognize that controversy, and I'm kind of like, I don't know how that one's going to sort out. A lot of people think that it will gradually uh, end up being very much like tobacco um, and cigar smoking today. Uh, there will remain a very loyal segment uh, that will want to smoke THC in the traditional manner, and that will mean they expect certain odor and, and, and what have you. Uh, probably the growth market of the future is going to go the other way. So when you think about authenticity in the cannabis space, uh, you can't help but think about Marley Natural. You know, the look, the vibe, the social aspects of the brand are completely aligned. You know, mass appeal and at the same time targeted to a specific market. Uh, this this is just a, a, a great example. And in, and, it, and in some ways, it's a little cliche that Bob Marley and reggae would, would be in the cannabis space. But if, but if you think about it, it's done in such a... a classy way and they have a real social conscious um, behind what they're actually doing some of the some of the, the social programs that they actually support really really relate and and it's done in in, in such a classy way and, and and everything that they do ties back to that and there's there's no doubt about the authenticity of this brand their messaging and what they're trying to communicate to the to the consumer um, and if you ever visit their their website, you know their their range of of pack types and product types. It's just it's just amazing how their accessories tie into their products and how you use the product. And they use you know various types of materials to sell different different products. This is just this is just one e example. So just a, a quick technical um, uh, breakdown of hemp straw. Um, you have your fiber on the outside of the stalk, which is your very high strength, high stiffness, uh, high performance uh, material. And then in the center of the stem is your herd. Well, in a lot of cases, the fiber only makes up about 20 to 25% of the material that can be um, obtained from the stock of the material, while your herd or woody core 
makes up then the, the remainder of the material. And so in order for a, it to be economically feasible to process straw, you have to be able to make product or sell product based on both the fiber as well as the herd. Um, and if you look a little bit more closely as you break down those fibers into in individual uh, fiber bundles and then individual filaments on their own, one thing that is very striking and, and unusual for the composites manufacturing industry is that their, their cross sections are not circular. Um, they're irregular, sometimes hexagonal in shape. Um, and then also when you harvest the stock, also uh, uh, determine certain properties or performance of the material. Older fibers tend to uh, develop this center lumen that is a hollow structure and the properties of your fiber actually go down as the fiber um, uh, matures and, and, and becomes old. Whereas your younger fibers are the ones that tend to be stronger and um, um, better for high performance applications. And then of course your hemp herd that comes from the core, uh, the center of the stock, which I, I mentioned makes up about 70% of the materials that come out of your, your stock of, of hemp. What gets material scientists like myself really excited about these materials, however, is their properties and their performance. If you look at all the natural fibers available to us, whether they are from leaf or stem, um, uh, seed types of um, agricultural uh, biomass, hemp and flax of bast, both bast fibers have some of the highest strength, highest uh, stiffness or modulus and uh, some of the lowest or moderate uh, density, especially in comparison to some of our, our um, traditional reinforcing uh, materials such as fiberglass or carbon fiber or Kevlar. You know, you talked about the labeling side of things. Mm -hmm. well, I know in particular, you know, there's different options that people have when they make packaging of any type. You know, it could be a compostable version, a recycled content version. You know, or maybe even like a, a version that's made to be easily recycled. You know, and so when you're looking at uh, labeling for those three different types, how how like um, how common do you want to make it? What I mean by that is, with your compostable version, let's say, do you is it imperative that your labeling is also compostable? You know, and then if you're doing a recycled content version. Is it not, you know, worry about the compostability of the label because the tube isn't, you know, so you just want to make something that's easily recyclable or is that too difficult to try to marry? What, what's been your experience with trying to line that up? Yeah, that's a great question. It's been a continual um, area that we've tried to find solutions for. And I guess the thing that I'll say first and foremost is for any cannabis product, we believe the most important thing is that it's going to look good on the shelf, right? Like in, when you're making that decision around sustainability, it's got to be something that's going to sell. If the packaging doesn't sell, if the label doesn't sell it, then there's, then that's, yeah, that's useless. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we've always focused on is really the, the quality of the label. And with our product specifically, like a pre-roll tube, that's a tight radius product. And so finding a label that adheres through different environment types and over time um, has been really difficult. And so I have seen some compostable options out there. Um, oftentimes the, um, the adhesive properties of it and stuff have been an issue. Um, and so first and foremost, we'll, we'll point a customer in the direction of um, just a basic basic label, most of them are poly polypropylene, BOPP. Um, there's some new technologies out there that we're looking into, such as in-mold labeling, which is what we're excited about. Basically, it'll match the material type with the tube type, and so you won't have to ask the um, consumer to remove the label. I know mm -hmm. here in Colorado and talking to recycling facilities, um, some of them do have a process that does you know, remove the label from it, from the tube, but uh, it's just overall been a, a big headache in the cannabis space. And then, you put on top of that the the regulations around what needs to be put on that label and so the size of the label etc um we have these conversations with our customers too you know do we put on the on the label directions around please remove after use etc um, the other option is to use an outer outer packaging right so you could just do a, a, a blank blank tube um and then a box around that so both of those could be separately easily recyclable as themselves um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, uh, 
an area that needs improvement for sure. Mm -hmm. The it's I believe it's only one percent of all of the uh, or about three hundred sixty tons of all of the um, plastic that's produced on an annual basis uh, that's made from renewable resources. And so uh, there's a huge role to play for cannabis in twofold. One of which, of course, uh, is those actual uh, increases or decreases in petroleum usage, but the other being in um, the support of um, hemp based, which is what uh, I'm proud, uh, proud to hear Olvin uh, Chad uh, describing um, those technologies move towards commercialization. And so again, our at, uh, at Green Tech or for me personally as well, the largest mission really was to uh, provide a new avenue and to, to spur the industry to understand that uh, innovation in the space of hemp, uh, in the space of biomass and, and, and lignocellulosic um, uh, ethanols and, and, and biofuels, biochemicals is a future state, is a future or uh, is an avant-garde of um, the opportunities that lie in American resources and in, uh, in opportunities to, to employ American citizens and, and develop Ameri uh, American infrastructure. And so um, really the, the, the idea behind bioplastics or the, the, the fervor behind it should be that uh, we're, we're creating an independence, uh, an economic independence for ourselves that, we, that was spurred by uh, this improbable or unlikely um, uh, legalization of, 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 of cannabis, of hemp.